and you were dead in the trespasses and sins in which you once walked, following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience, among whom we all once lived in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and the mind, and were by nature children of wrath like the rest of mankind. But God, being rich in mercy, because of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved and raised us up with him and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus, so that in the coming ages he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace in kindness towards us in Christ Jesus. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not your own doing, it is the gift of God, not a result of work, so that no one may boast, for we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. Some of you might remember an incident in 2010, and it was just after lunch, and part of the San Jose copper mine in northern Chile collapsed underground. Do you remember the scene? Do you remember the incident? Uh, and it was this horrific, horrific incident, and the whole world heard about it in the media, where these miners were trapped underground turning the 33 men, aged from 19 to 63 at the time, into prisoners. It took 17 days to even find them alive, 600 meters below at the bottom of the century-old mine, trapped underground for 69 days, battling starvation, and hopelessness as the world waited anxiously for news of their rescue. Do you remember it? There was this utter helplessness that uh, almost everyone around the world who could understand what was going on, they were helpless, without hope, unable to rescue themselves, but they were rescued. And there is a sense in which Paul is describing here the condition of humanity before God's hand touches individuals like you if you are a believer this morning. But God, but God, did something extraordinary. The section here that uh, is at the beginning of Ephesians 2 is actually connected with uh, the, the latter section of chapter 1 of Ephesians there from verse 15, uh, where the heading there in the ESV is thanksgiving and prayer. And so this section goes along with the previous section and where one of the common denominators is the power of God. Verse 19 and 20 in, verse, in chapter 1 uh, says, And what is the immeasurable greatness of his power towards us who believe, according to the working of his great might that he works in Christ Jesus. Jesus Christ was dead, but God raised and exalted him. If you are a believer here this morning, you were dead, and God raised and exalted you with Christ. There is a union with Christ. You are, uh, you, are, you are exalted with Christ. And verses 1 to 3 of chapter 2 is the, if you like, the human con condition, the, the, the universal human condition of every single human being in the entire world. And if we had to summarize, and we need to get a good handle of these first three verses of chapter two, 
before we think about what God has done for us. Um, verses 1 to 3 is the, is, is the human condition, if you like. And if we had to summarize it, what Paul is saying here, he is saying that we were dead, that we were slaves, we were dead and we were slaves, and we were condemned, if you are a believer here this morning. Dead, slaves, and condemned. We were dead from verses 1 to, do, one to 2. This is everyone's spiritual condition outside of Christ. Our children, uh, from the day that they were born, were rebels. That's one of the things that Paul is saying. If you've got children, if you've got grandchildren, if you, you say to your child, don't touch that glass. <laughs> you, you can see that, that, that they're just hankering after going to that glass because they've been told not to do it. On the, on the way driving here, I, I was going uh, over the limit, and every time, every now and again, my wife will say, watch the speed, love, watch the speed, watch the speed. And I've got a sort of the, where, where you can set your speed in. And if, the, if it's 60, I will put 61 or 62, just to say, well, I can do it. Nobody can tell me what to do. And there is a sense in which that is our spiritual condition. Nobody can tell me what to do, and we were born rebels. How dare God tell me what I can do or what, what I can't do? We were dead in our trespasses. That is, death is, is traced to that word trespasses or transgressions and sins in verse 1. A trespass is a false step. And sin means missing the mark, doesn't it? We miss the standard which God has given us. And then I imagine somebody saying, but you may say, you know, that I am dead. And how can Paul say to me that I am dead in my trespasses? How can I be dead when I feel more alive than I've ever felt in my whole life? The world is my oyster. I am going places. I am so strong. I am being successful. I am going places. Aren't I doing really, really well? I am ambitious. And by the way, my friends, the friends that I spend my time with, they are ambitious. And we're going to do stuff. The world is my oyster. My friends are happy, and we are happy together, and there is a deep contentment with all that we do. Physically, perhaps you're a runner, perhaps you play football, and you're thinking to yourself, I am in tip-top shape. I am doing really, really, really well. I'm at the top of my game, or I'm an academic. I have a lively mind. I have the lively mind of a scholar. How can Paul say that I am dead. And the answer to that is that yes, you are dead in that which matters the most. You have no life in that which matters the most. You are dead. You were slaves to sin. Sin had this hold on you that you couldn't uh, be released from, you are dead, you are slaves to sin, and we were condemned. We notice that in verse 3, we were dead, we were slaves, and we were condemned, among whom we all once lived in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and the mind, and were by nature children of wrath like the rest of mankind. What is God's wrath? I wonder if you wonder that yourself. What is the wrath of God? Well, God's wrath is not like your anger, my anger. Um, it is not like having a bad temper so that uh, 
God cannot fly off the handle at the smallest of reasons like you and I possibly can do. Uh, Somebody says something to us and we've been stressed and there's stuff going on in our lives and we fly off the handle. God doesn't do that. His wrath is not spite or malice or animosity or revenge. I'm going to get them because of the things that they have done. God's wrath is never arbitrary. And so something that we can say about his wrath is that it is entirely predictable. We know. We know what his wrath is because we have been told, we have been warned. It is entirely predictable. It is never subject to mood or a whim. What is God's wrath? Well, one person put it like this. It is God's personal wrath. Righteous, constant hostility to evil, his settled refusal to compromise with it, and his resolve instead to condemn it. His resolve to condemn evil and sin. And so if that has made us really, really to cause, to cause us to think. Perhaps we're asking, what is the solution? And then, what has God done for us? And the answer to that, says Paul, is that God has saved us. God has saved us. If you are a follower of Jesus Christ, But God, but God. And you see, he he begins the section by taking us right down to the reality of our standing before a holy, righteous God from the day that we were born. But to the Ephesians who are followers of Jesus Christ, he says, but God has done a wonderful thing beautiful, amazing thing. He has done a beautiful thing in and through His Son, Jesus Christ. Why has God done it? Why has He done the beautiful thing that He has done in and through Jesus Christ, we may ask? It is not because of anything in you or me. Like you and I like to think. It has nothing to do with who you are, your success, your personality, your wealth, your friendships, your likes on Facebook. It has nothing to do with you, but everything to do with who the everlasting God is. It is all about God, but God. God, Paul says, but God, and then he goes on to describe what he has done, and it is out of his rich mercy, out of his love, out of his grace, verse 5 and 8, out of his kindness, verse 7. A famous uh, theologian talking about the doctrine of election, he said, Paraphrasing, he said something like this, God doesn't go beyond himself when he is talking about the doctrine of election. He doesn't go beyond himself. Do you see what he is saying? He is saying that it is all of God. It is all of God and what he has done for us. For some of you, there was never a time when you when you didn't believe, you perhaps grew up in the church and from a very young age, you just believed in, in Jesus and what he had done for you. For, for, the, for others, perhaps this morning you, you, you lived a seemingly successful, ambitious, happy, 
contented life. You, you had your friends and you were all in the same boat together. The world was your oyster again. And at some point you realize, perhaps through an event or through an accumulation of events, at some point you got to a point where you, where you realized that something was missing in your life. That there was something missing. And perhaps that is you this morning. You, you, you've got to a point where you think there must be more to what I am experiencing in, in, in this life. And amazingly, Paul says that even when the world is your oyster, when you are at the top of your game, when you're getting straight A's, where you feel so alive, you feel bulletproof. Remember those days. You feel bulletproof because you can do everything that you want to do. You were dead, says Paul, when it came to what matters the most, your relationship with God. But God had other plans for you. Friends, for a brief moment more, I want to look at four things that are to do with the plan of God that we see in these verses. We see four things about God's plan for, for sinners saved by grace, like, like you and I, if you are a believer this morning. First of all, God's plan is personal. It's beautiful. It's personal. As for you, as for you, God deals with us in a personal capacity, doesn't he? God called Moses, didn't he? He, he said to Moses at the burning bush, remember the scene, Moses, Moses. And Moses said, here I am. Personal, speaks to him. Here I am. Uh, Jesus said to Paul on the, road to on the road to Damascus, remember the scene, uh, Paul is walking around, uh, along the road, on, on the road, and, and Jesus says, why do you persecute me? What, what are you doing to Christians as personal to me? Stop doing what you're doing. He is a personal God. He is personal. You cannot know God as personal through general revelation, but we can know that God is personal through his word, through special revelation. I love how personal um, Jesus gets in the high priest, priestly prayer, John 17, 6, I have revealed you to those whom you gave me out of the world. They were yours. You gave them to me, and they have obeyed your word. Now, they know that everything you have given me comes from you. Personal. I wonder if you enjoy camping. Well, in the summertime just past, we, the three of us were in our tent and uh, the, the sun had gone down and uh, my daughter, Faith, woke up at one point and uh, you can imagine we were in this foreign environment in the campsite and my daughter called out to me, Daddy, Daddy, are you there? And I responded to my daughter and I said, Faith, I'm here. I am here. And we had this wonderful personal interaction with each other. She could talk to me and I responded to her. And so such is God. Sorry about talking about my daughter, but there was a point uh, again, she would, as a, at a certain age, and she would come out of Sunday school after the service, and uh, we would all be accumulating, chatting in the hall, and I, and I could sort of clock her coming out of where they would have their Bible, their, their, their Sunday school. She would come out, and she would look for her mother or her father, and she would clock one of us and make a beeline for us wherever we are. Personal personal relationships that we have in our lives. God is not some distant deity who wants nothing to do with us. He sent his son Jesus into the world. He is 
personal. Other religions are impersonal. Think of Islam, if God wills it, we never know what God's will is. But if God wills it, so be it. And compare that to what Jesus did. He put on flesh and he came into the world. He became one of us. Personal God. I loved a story that I came across of a doctor who was running the New York Marathon. And he was running with this throng of people. And the next minute he heard this cry for help. And there was this runner that had collapsed on the tarmac. And this doctor ran to this person who had collapsed. And uh, the doctor began to give CPR and deal with him. And and the next minute, there were some paramedics that came along, and they got a defibrillator and uh, had to put the defib on her, and and, uh, she was saved. But as the doctor was telling the story, he said, you know, nobody else came to the help of that person who had collapsed. She had had a heart attack. Not one other person. You could see the people looking at their watches because they were so concerned about the time that they were going to do the marathon in. And the doctor went to that person and attended to her. That reminds us of Christ and the personal nature of redemption that he came and he died for you and for me. If there was nobody else in the whole world, he would have died for you. And this morning, we are reminded as we come to the table of the words, this is my body which is for you. Isn't that beautiful? My body which is for you. Not only is it... uh, a personal plan, but it's a powerful plan. We think of the work of the Holy Spirit that is involved, involved here, verses 5 and 6, even when we were dead and our trespasses made us alive with Christ. Paul said, I have been crucified with Christ and I no longer live. The life I now live is by faith in Christ. We have the work of of God's power and creation, don't we? Don't you love just looking out over the water, over the Tay River, or looking out at the sunsets at the moment and at the sunrises and see the beauty of creation and think of the power of God and creation. God spoke things into being and God said, let there be light and there was light. By the power of God, things came into existence. God made the heavens and the earth. Through him, all things were made. In the conversation between Nicodemus and Jesus, Jesus says to Nicodemus, you must be born again. You must be born from above. There must be a work of God, the Holy Spirit, in your life. The power of God at work. And Paul had already prayed Uh, that they may know the incomparably great power for us who believe. And that power will sustain us until glory. The power of the Holy Spirit in your life and in my life, we pray that people would turn to Jesus, that God would do a powerful work in their lives. We pray for miracles. We pray for the power of God to be at work in a service like this, that the Holy Spirit would be ministering to us, speaking to us, applying the word to our lives by the power of the Holy God, not by anything that I can do or say, but by the power of the Holy Spirit. Isn't it amazing when we reflect on the power of God? There's so many things where we see power, don't we? We stopped off on the way down and bank foot. And there are all sorts of uh, things that you can buy. And there were some models that uh, were operating. And this model was of a train. And it was a, a model made of wood. 
And uh, it's intriguing. I almost bought it. It was 50-something pounds, but it was absolutely beautiful. But this train was working. It was operational. And I was looking inside for the power source. And I, I couldn't find the power source, but it was inside there somewhere. There must have been a battery that was operating this, this, this wooden uh, uh, train. It was, it was just something to me anyway. It was, it was great. Power inside do you often wonder and remember things of your childhood and I when I think of power I, I think of, of, of the waves in South Africa the seas were were so powerful there and we used to go and with, with, with a big storm we used to go and see the sea and go and, and sort of sit on the beach where there was rocks there and the waves would pound onto the rocks and there would be this massive big splash of of water coming up amazing and then we think of the power of God that is far greater than anything that we that we witness in in our lives or in nature or anything like that the 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 Americans were concerned because the Russians were going to send some nuclear thing up into space and the Americans were sort of besides themselves and and we think of everything in this whole world God's power is far greater than anything that we that we see or experience or will experience in this world and yet God's power is controlled and he uses it to bring life he uses it to bring life he, he used it, used it to transform, to take people who were dead in their trespasses and sins and give them new life and, and to use them in the church and, and to use them in, in other people's lives. And that's not to suggest that everyone's conversion story is like the Damascus Road experience. We tend to, to make the mistake that, that everyone has this big massive moment with, with shining lights and this bright light in the sky. And some of us are waiting for the bright light. Some of us are, are waiting for the Damascus Road experience. And for many of us, in fact, most of us, that is not the experience. We grew up in the church and there was never a time when we didn't believe. For many people, they say, that there was never a time when I didn't believe. And they would say, as somebody put it like this, I cannot tell how the work was accomplished. All I know is that a sensible change has taken place in the course of my affections. And that whereas I was once blind, now I see. I cannot understand it, but this work of God I know has taken place in my life. I, 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 I saw the world and with gray eyes, if you like, at one point, and then suddenly I saw the world with, with, with this luminous, beautiful, just magnificent light. I wonder if you can relate to that in some way. The power of God in the life of the sinner. Where things become clear, where they were darkened before. We don't see things perfectly clear but but things become different and, and and beautiful and we're reminded this morning of the power of the resurrection <laughs> that power that is that work in the life of of the sinner that power was seen amazingly in the resurrection he died Jesus died and he rose again after three days isn't God's plan amazing but God we see as well that God's plan is, is practical. God's plan is practical. Verse 10, for we are, are, are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. We do not... We are not changed, and we, we have the, okay, we, we're converted, and then God says, right, go, just go and do your own thing. I don't care what you do. No, he says, come in and join me. Join, join the church. Put your hand up and say, yeah, I, I, I want to be involved. I want to be part of God's army to make a difference in the world. Practical. 
the practical nature of salvation. It is not only the doctrine that we need to understand, what has taken place here. We need to understand that it is practical as well. Something happens, we change, and then we become part of his army. And that is wonderful. Paul, up until this point, has described salvation in terms of a resurrection from the dead, a liberation from slavery, and a rescue from condemnation. And and each declares that it is the work of God that has taken place. But now he, he puts it beyond doubt. Salvation is creation, recreation, new creation. John Calvin said about that word created. He said, you see then that this word create is enough to stop the mouths and put away the cackling of such as boast of having any merit For when they say so, they presuppose that they were their own creators. A baby has nothing to do with her procreation. It is all a work of God, but God. What's the implication of this practicality? Well, one of the implications is that serving God becomes a matter of gratitude and not duty. I don't come to, to help with the coffee after the service. Oh, because, okay, well, nobody else is going to do it. Then I'm going to do it. No, we do it because we have this incredible sense of gratitude for what God has done for you and me in and through Christ Jesus. We do it because something remarkable has been done for us outside of ourselves, nothing to do with who we are. Lord, how can I, how can I serve you? Show me where I can help. Just show me and I will do it. You've done so much for me. Little old me who was lost, dead in my trespasses and sins. But Lord, you have made me alive. You have given me new life. What can I do for you? Is that our attitude? Do we know something of what Christ has done for us this morning? Serving God becomes a matter of gratitude. Serving God becomes more of a celebration of of our riches in Christ than a chore that I must do. Let's notice lastly that God's plan is pleasurable. God's plan is, is pleasurable. Do you think? That God going through his mind at some point, you're thinking, all right, well, I'm caught of a bit of a bind here. And I have no other option but to save these rascals. That is not what we're told in the Bible. But because he is rich in mercy, love, and grace. And all these words speak of a benevolent God, a giving God, a God who so loved the world that he gave his only son, that whoever believes in him will not perish but have eternal life, a God who is for us. He did not come to condemn the world, but that so that the world might be saved through him. We sometimes think of God as one who acted not out of love but out of necessity, because he had no other option, and the opposite is true. He saved us because of his deep pleasure, borne out by the fact of the costliness of the cross. Yeah, it was costly. It wasn't as if God said, well, okay, it's not, it's not, it's not going to cost me much, and so well, I'll just go for it. If it's going to give them pleasure, then I'm happy about it. no. It caused the death of his beloved son. 
when we take a step back from, I, I'm, I'm, not a, I'm not a great artist. I, I, I don't appreciate art very well. But every now and again, when you come across a, a nice painting, you take a step back from it. Do you often wonder at what the painter was thinking about, what the artist was thinking about, what was, what was going through their minds when you come across a beautiful painting and you think, wow. You think, what was the artist thinking about? What was, what was going through their mind? What inspired him or her to paint that painting? Up north, I, I don't know. I'm... I'm really, really ignorant about the northern lights. I've never seen them. I know you get them up in the highlands. Have you ever seen them? Do you see the northern lights? What do you think? What goes through your mind when you see, see something as beautiful as the, as, as the array of, of, of the light, the green and, 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 and the beautiful lights flashing? What goes through your mind when you see that? Well, for many people, it would be, well, what, what's the science behind this? Isn't, isn't nature, isn't Mother Nature amazing that, that you can see su such beauty, all these chemicals coming together? If you're a believer, you say, what an amazing God we have. What an amazing God we have. And when you meditate and reflect on the cross of Jesus Christ. I hope you do the same and more. What an amazing God we have. Do you do that? Do you do that? Do you know what it is to get, to grasp, the love of God shown for you on the cross. That he sent his son to die for you. In this is love. Not that we have loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son as a propitiation for our sins. It wasn't pleasurable in what Christ went through. It was very, very, very costly. It, it cost him his life. This morning we're reminded of the cost of discipleship. Some of you have lost friends. Some of you were going with a group of friends and you got to a point where you realized that your priorities have to change. Some of you, your God is football. Your idol is football. For some of you, your idol was football. And you gave that up. There's nothing wrong with football. But it came down the list. God came first. Costly. This morning, there is no better place to be right here, right here where we are. It's hard sometimes to follow Jesus because we love our sin, don't we? But we know that sin cannot and must not rule our lives. This morning we're reminded that in God's pleasure, he saved us, but it was costly for him. Paul could say, oh, the riches of the depth of the riches of the wisdom and knowledge of God, how unsearchable his judgments and his paths beyond tracing out. Oh, the depth of the riches. How beautiful is the picture that we are shown here by Paul of salvation, of redemption of what God has done for you and for me in Christ Jesus. The personal plan, his plan was powerful, his plan was practical, and his plan was pleasurable.